Mexico's Baja Peninsula has a climate and a cuisine that's different from the rest of the country. Now, it's what they call a Mediterranean climate, wet in the winter and dry in the summer, unlike the more tropical climate that you'll find in the rest of Mexico. And at a restaurant like Tres Virgenes in La Paz, that climate and the great local seafood inspires the menu of the chef there, Jesus Chavez. These look a little different than what I'm used to working with. These must be from local waters. Yes, these are caught about 20 kilometers from here on one of our beaches. Cool. And uh, we have a guy that just catches the octopus for the restaurant and goes out every morning and comes back and, and brings the octopus to us. Okay, so then you're just dipping the octopus in oil after it's been simmered till it's just the right stage and then cooking it over the mesquite. Yeah, it's a very simple marinade. It's ponzu sauce. Ponzu sauce? Ponzu sauce. Now, I keep seeing all this sort of Asian influence in a lot of the chefs in Baja. You know, I, I come from up north, northern Baja, so we have a lot of a very big Chinese community up yeah. there. So it's natural for us to be familiar with all those ingredients from Asia. So you've got a marinade that starts with ponzu sauce. Ponzu sauce, olive oil, olive oil. Baja olive oil, yeah. has uh, ancho powder, uh -huh. and it has a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. That, Just a little now bit. Now that's, to me, a kind of quintessential Baja dish mm -hmm. with the influences of the Mediterranean, influences of Asia, and then very clearly set in Mexico with that ancho powder. Yes, definitely. The ancho powder gives it that smoky, uh, very Mexican-like uh, flavor. All you have to do is take one taste of the food here and you think Mediterranean. You get it so clearly when you smell the sea air. When you look at the landscape that's filled with those beautiful olive trees and vineyards that produce great oil and wine. When you taste the artisanal cheeses and wander through those inspiring gardens. One of my favorite gardens anywhere in the world is at Rancho La Puerta in Tecate. And not just because it's so beautiful but because of the gardener, Salvador, who is one of the most passionate guys I know. And the cool thing is, he said that I could choose anything I wanted from the garden and then go into their teaching kitchen and cook it. And you're growing all the different colors of chard, right? Yeah. Let's get some of them, all of it here. Okay. You gotta help me. What are those flowers up there? Uh, that is daikon blossom. You wanted a tasting now? Uh... Ah, I want I want daikon blossom. Okay, Let's perfect. go for that. This is something completely new to me. Oh yes, try the one. Now the little pods. That little pot is perfect because it's very tender. The flavor in the blossom. Oh my! The... <laughs> <laughs> it's like pea pods. It's, yeah. They're really good. I love the little spiciness that they add at the end of them. Yeah. The flavor. Is this the garlic? Yes, yeah, it's the green garlic. Along with that green garlic, we went on to pick a remarkable variety of greens. Some red and green auric, some New Zealand spinach, and some Tuscan kale. Okay, now I've got it. idea here is to turn this green garlic into a green garlic mojo de ajo. You probably know the bath of garlic that's typically made with slow cooked regular garlic. Well, I'm going to use the green garlic out of the garden. Now, you treat these sort of like leeks. You split them from end to end after washing them really well. And then you slice them across into thin slices. Now, this is the time that you know these aren't lakes. This is garlic. All that garlic aroma just comes up to greet you. Put them into a saucepan and cover them with olive oil. Put in some salt there and I'm going to put it onto a low fire here and let it cook slowly, 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 until that green garlic is completely tender. 
Now in the meantime, I'm gonna make a roasted tomato and chile de arbol salsa. So I'm gonna take the chile de arbol that Salvador grew and put it into a skillet over here, heat it over a medium temperature. You'll know they're ready when the aroma of the chilies just comes up to greet you just like that garlic did. I'm going to put the toasted arbol chilies into the blender jar here and then add roasted tomatoes and roasted garlic. Now, roasted tomatoes, you can do them under a broiler. It's super easy to do that, but in Mexico, it's typical to put them on a comal or on a griddle. I just did these in a skillet. I lined it with a piece of foil and turned them until they're completely blackened, blistered, and soft all the way through. I'm not even gonna peel them for this particular robust rustic salsa. Put them in there. Beside it here, I've got some garlic cloves that I've dry roasted in a skillet. It takes about 15 minutes over medium heat, then peel off the papery skin. And then this gets blended until it's completely smooth. I'm gonna check it for consistency and give it a seasoning of salt. I can tell it's gonna be spicy and good because it hit me right in the back of the throat. Um, looks like it needs just a touch of water. So I'll put that in, blend it for a few more seconds. Pour some out into a serving dish here. That looks just the right consistency for this. Deep, robust, rustic, exactly what I was looking for. Now it's on to slicing up all those greens from the garden. After the mojo de ajo had simmered for 15 minutes or so, I seasoned it with some lime juice, some fresh epazote, and some lemon thyme. Then that went back onto the heat for another 10 minutes for all those flavors to come together. This riot of textures and flavors that I have on the cutting board here all get mixed together in the skillet. Take that back to the stove. A little of the oil from the green garlic mojo infused with epazote and lemon thyme. Give it a little bit of water. That'll just help the cooking to go evenly. Turn on the fire to about a medium high. Just stir it all together and let it cook until those greens are as tender as you like. I think with this mix, it'll probably take eight to 10 minutes. To make that perfect mixture into a perfect taco, you've got to have the perfect tortilla. And Maricela here is making fresh corn tortillas from fresh ground masa. Hot, fresh made tortilla, a little bit of our greens mixture, got some fresh made queso fresco, Mexican fresh cheese to sprinkle on the top of it, a little of our spicy arbol salsa, and remember those daikon blossoms? Sprinkle those spicy little things over the top. That's cooking local, organic, fresh, and delicious. I wanted to delve deeper into that Mediterranean side of Baja, so I trekked out to Rancho Olivares de Calafia in the Valle de Guadalupe. Now, as its name implies, it's a huge olive grove, but it surrounds this beautiful lamb farm, all of it under the direction of Manuel Acero. 
My chef friend Miguel Angel Guerrero had turned me on to this place because he loves their lamb and olive oil. It's amazing valley here, the Valle de Guadalupe that stretches from way up there uh -huh. to clear down there, and you've uh -huh. got a hundred thousand olive uh -huh. trees exactly right exactly. below us. That is so stunning. I've never seen anything like that okay. in my life. And then right in the middle of it. You have a lamb farm. <laughs> exactly. How did that all well, happen? Well, we are in one of the five Mediterranean areas of the world. In fact, Let's this explain is... Explain that. This what, is, what makes a Mediterranean... The Mediterranean climate. climate and the Mediterranean areas have to do with the ocean, have to do with the breeze, have to do with the mountains, the hills. It, it creates some microclimates mm -hmm. and vegetation that it permits also to, to have uh, olive groves to grow grapes for wine. Because this valley is very well known for great wine as well as a great olive oil. Well, the Baja Med concept comes from that. So, so yes, it just, it just, it just eases through. And if you come visit Valle de Guadalupe, you kind of start understanding where, where the concept comes from. You, you certainly do, just standing up here on this bluff, looking at this valley and thinking about grapes and thinking about olives and thinking about lamb. I could be in some place else, but exactly. we're not. We're in Mexico we're here. In Mexico. You guys have a word for it in Spanish here. We call it terruño. Yeah. Um, some call it querencia. And as I was putting an example the other day, if a horse gets lost here and, and it you know goes a couple ranches down, it always comes back to its terruño. It always comes back home because this is where it was born. Mm -hmm. This is where you were born, right? Yeah, that's what you feel who you are. You, know? you feel who you are, and you must love that word, querencia, because well, you named a restaurant. That's that. a, that's this is your place, like querencia. you say, that querencia, that place that you go back to. Uh -huh. You always leave, but you always come back where you feel uh -huh. safe. Talk to me more about the lambs. If you just go to the restaurants where, where, where we deliver this lamb, it's, it's just, you can just tell the difference. And mm -hmm. it's not so much genetics, it's not so much other things, it's just the Mediterranean way of life. At Chef Miguel Angel's restaurant in Tijuana, it's called La Querencia, he's made quite a name for himself, mostly for having incredible local ingredients, a lot of talent, and an enviable grill. That is a beautiful leg of lamb. It's from yes. the lamb farm. Lamb farm. Where did you marinate it in? Lemon thyme. Yes. We have uh, rock salt. Yeah. Shallots. Garlic and yeah. some olive oil from the, the ranch. Oh, we from the ranch where we were, Olivares. we got, yes, where yeah. we had the lamb. Yeah. It's a small leg of lamb. Four pounds. Yeah. So, so you're going to spit roast it? We're going to roast it and then let's keep real here. Show me, show me. Please. Put it here. We are the motor. Okay. <laughs> So we've got the leg of lamb that's cooking on the spit, yes. and I noticed that you have two more lamb cuts. You got a double cut lamb, lamb chop, chop, and then this is lamb loin. Lamb loin. Okay. Explain this whole idea to us because we have three cuts of lamb. I want to try to explain in one dish. Yes. My cuisine. Baja Perfect. Me. Perfect. So what do we need to do next? Take everything to go and. Take the grill. Onto the grill, to the boss grill, aren't we? Okay. <laughs> Beautiful lamb, and I know because I tasted it already. You gave me a little taste of it there. Miguel Angel's finished dish was Baja on a plate. Lamb leg with fruity mole, a blue cheese dressed salad, grilled lamb chops with soy dressed shiitakes, lamb loin and salsa matcha with couscous and pine nut oil. This is spectacular. It's all Baja or my cuisine, how I, how I see it. I can't wait to dig into it. Grilled lamb with salsa matcha and roasted fennel. Sounds pretty good, but 
Doesn't sound very Mexican, really. Yet that's a combination that has become a kind of classic in the northern part of the Baja Peninsula. Well, and the salsa matra doesn't really seem very Mexican either, but it's this delicious infusion of olive oil and dried chilies with a little nuts and garlic. <laughs> the truth is, you can find that salsa matcha everywhere from the taquerias to the fancy restaurants. Mm -hmm. And when you start to make that salsa, the first thing you have to do is choose dried chilies. You can use practically any kind of dried chilies to make this. I like a combination of sweet ancho chilies. We've got the dark, long pasilla negro chilies and the smoky hot chipotles. And of course, you gotta clean them first. So you pull out the stem, open them up and let the seeds fall out. And then you gotta cut up the chilies into smaller pieces. So I like to tear them into flat pieces like that. I'm gonna give you a pair of scissors and take this one. And then you wanna cut them into pieces that are about half inch and then cut those into smaller pieces like that. Now, while Lainey continues on with the cleaning and the chopping of the, the chilies, I'm going to start the olive oil base. I'm gonna put this pot over about medium heat here and pour in two cups of really good olive oil. And to that olive oil, we're going to add some nuts and seeds. And this, just as with the dried chilies, you can use practically anything that you have on hand. I'm gonna put some peanuts in there, some almonds, and some sesame seeds. cloves of garlic, which I'm going to peel and then halve. Now that's going to go into the pot here. We're going to stir it around a little bit. It'll start to come up to a little simmer. And after about five minutes, you'll notice that that garlic and that sesame in there will start to brown. That's when we're gonna add the chilies to it. Now, final ingredient seasonings will be, of course, some salt and vinegar mixed together and a little bit of dried herbs. I've got some Mexican oregano and some thyme. So you wanna prepare that part of it. I'm going to add a little of this Mexican oregano that I'm gonna crush between my palms. It releases all that beautiful aroma. A little tiny bit of dried thyme. A little of this goes a long way. Also crushing that between my fingers to release that aroma. And Lainey's got a tablespoon of vinegar and with a teaspoon of salt. A teaspoon of salt that goes in here. And that vinegar and salt will just infuse itself right into the beautiful Ooh. aromatic dried <laughs> it chili. Sure smells good. Now this incredibly aromatic mixture is gonna go into the blender jar and get pulsed to chop all the larger pieces, especially the nuts, into smaller ones. Now to roast fresh fennel, you first have to chop up the fennel. You cut off the stock part of it. You can save that to make a soup with. I always trim off some of the root end of it. What is that? Aromatic. Mm -hmm. Smell that. <laughs> sort Whoa. of anise yeah, kind of smell. Yeah, very And then cut each half into four or five pieces. I'm going to lay all this fennel here in this pan. And now we're going to drizzle all this fennel in here with some of our salsa matcha, trying to get mostly the oily part. And because this fennel is going to spend quite a bit of time in the oven, I'm going to drizzle in about a quarter of a cup of water and then cover it with foil.
and then into the oven it goes. It's gonna cook at 325 for just over an hour until tender. One of my very favorite things to do in the whole wide world is to grill. But living here in Chicago, that means a whole chunk of the year I don't get to do what I really like to do. So I decided to really investigate how to grill in my fireplace. But it's a little different. First, you're working on wood. You're not working on charcoal. So you gotta have a grill that can accommodate that. And I don't know any better and simpler way to do it than to put one of these Tuscan grills in here. So I've got my beautiful salsa matcha here. I've got lovely, lovely lamb chops. And I think that pretty much the easiest way to get the flavor of those two things to go together is to drizzle the matcha over the lamb chops, smear it all around so you get some of the beautiful, robust spiciness and clearly all that great olive oil flavor all over the lamb chops. Give them a sprinkling of salt, and then flip them over and season the other side exactly the same way. Now they're gonna go on to the grill grate, and we're gonna grill them until the doneness I like, which is about medium rare. That should take three or four minutes per side, depending on the heat of my fire. Now we're ready to serve. Jair Tellez, another one of Baja's well-known chefs, has been a trailblazer in modern Baja cuisine for more than a decade at his restaurant Laja in the Valle de Guadalupe. Jair takes full advantage of what Baja has to offer, especially produce from his own garden and stuff from the sea, even the formidable gooey duck clam. Gooey duck clams. I've eaten them, but I've never worked with them before. So what do you do when you get a clam that looks like that? It has this very peculiar skin. Yes. And we poach it in uh, boiling water. Oh, you poach it in boiling yeah. water? You put like the whole clam seconds. in there. Just to chuck it. Yes. And then okay. you will peel away the this thing very shell. easily. OK. After poaching, you have to pry the shell off and peel the skin from the exposed part and then slice it thin. Then he arranged the slices in a deep plate, topped them with a little lemon juice, not lime here, and some of the liquid from the gooey duck. And then he put on some fresh fennel fronds, aromatic cilantro, a few beautiful borage flowers, and finally a little grated lemon zest and thinly sliced red scallion. A little drizzle of uh, olive oil olive because oil. I've figured out that in this valley almost every dish has to have a little drizzle of the local olive oil on it. Somehow we always do that. Andres, Chayer's partner in the restaurant, is also a winemaker and he brought in a beautiful minerally crisp rosé to pair with that ceviche. So when I think about ceviche, I always think about fresh fish obviously and about lime juice. But in this one, I'm also getting the flavor of that olive oil oh, yes, in there, which gives it a it's completely, fruity. it's fruity I mean, olive oil. And some richness. Some richness to it, which a lot of people don't associate with oh, any yes. kind of ceviche. Cheers. Cheers to you, my friend. Cool. Thanks for some good food and good wine. Mm -hmm. 